we can we can start. So hello, hello to everyone. I can't say uh, good evening, good morning, good uh, good afternoon. I mean, nowadays with uh, with such uh, uh, devices that we're using, we have people from uh, from across the globe, and that's uh, in itself exciting. Although it would be very nice to have uh, received our uh, two guests for this uh, this session. Uh, uh, here in uh, in London. Um, actually, we have three participants, and uh, two of them are in, uh, in in Israel. If I'm not wrong, Bashir, you're there now. Yair is you're there, and Leila is in the United States in uh, in Boston. Correct. I'm in London. Okay. So, um, so that's in itself already an international panel and uh, and that uh, fits with i mean fits the the book uh, quite well but first of that let me remind you that this is an event organized by the soas middle east uh, institute and the center for palestine studies uh, whose chairperson is dina matar she's here with us on the panel uh, but uh, 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 not uh, showing for the, for the moment at least um, so uh, very, very great and warm welcome to, to our participants and for this uh, presentation and discussion of uh, a very important book <clears throat> and uh, even more important in the light of all the, 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 the tensions that uh, we have seen here in the UK in particular and in, in many countries over the, 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 the recent uh, months and years uh, on uh, everything related to the Arab and the Jewish questions, as the, the, the title of the book uh, uh, says, the <clears throat> geographies of engagement in Palestine and beyond. And indeed, this engagement is very much, uh, has been very much a topic of discussion uh, uh, recently again. So um, the, 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 let me just introduce our speakers, although I, I presume that uh, the people attending uh, this uh, session have, uh, have uh, read about it, about uh, the, the event, uh, but this will be online as a video <clears throat> and uh, therefore uh, it is useful to, to, to introduce the, the speakers. So we have uh, the two editors of, uh, of the book published by uh, uh, Columbia University Press, The Arab and Jewish Questions, Geographies of Engagement, uh, as we said, in Palestine and beyond. The two editors are uh, Bashir Bashir and uh, Leila Farsakh, who are both of us with, with us here. Uh, Bashir is uh, associate professor in the Department of uh, Sociology, Political Science and Communication at the Open University of, uh, of Israel and a senior research fellow at the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute. He is the co-editor of the Holocaust and the Nakba, a new grammar of trauma and history also at Columbia University Press uh, uh, two years. I mean, it's a book that came out two years ago. Leila is uh, Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of uh, Massachusetts, uh, Boston. Uh, she's the author of, uh, of uh, several publications, among which uh, Palestinian Labor Migration to Israel, uh, <coughs> Labor, Land and Occupation, uh, a book that uh, came out in a second edition in 2012, and also of uh, commemorating the, the Nakba, uh, evoking the Nakba subtitle uh, book of uh, 2008. Uh, her forthcoming book is entitled Rethinking Statehood in Palestine, and this should be coming out this year. Uh, uh, Bashir and Leila will, will talk for uh, close to 10 minutes each. Um, that's shorter than what we have been used to in, uh, in this series, but that's because we have a discussant who is my colleague Yair Walach from, uh, from SAWAS, who heads also the, the center, who used to head the Center for uh, Jewish Studies at, uh, uh, at SAWAS. And uh, um, he is presently on sabbatical. That's why he is uh, to, I mean, intervening from, from Israel where, where he went for his uh, sabbatical. Um, so Yair will be acting as discussant. He will uh, 
speak for uh, something like 15 minutes uh, or so, uh, expressing his uh, comments on the book, uh, which is a collective book. We were speaking with the editors, but we have a, a very fine list of, uh, there is a very fine list of contributors uh, to, the, to the book. Um, and maybe when presenting it, uh, Bashir uh, or Leila will, uh, will maybe mention, uh, mention them. Uh, and uh, after that, both our uh, uh, the, both both editors may get get back to 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 the, the, the discussing uh, um, Yair's comment. After which, we will be taking the uh, your questions, which uh, I mean for the audience should be uh, posted on uh, the Q and A device uh, here on Zoom for those who are on Zoom. Uh, we can't use the chat uh, uh, for this. We just uh, can use the, the Q&A to uh, write your questions, comments, or whatever you want our panelists to, uh, to, to discuss. Um, okay then, so without any uh, further delay, let us uh, move to the, 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 the event itself. And, uh, uh, who wants uh, to start? Uh, Bashir, you said you want to, you, you will be starting. Please put your mic on. I will. Leila goes first. Leila, okay, sorry. <laughs> well, okay. thank you very much, uh, Gilbert, and thank you for the Center for Palestine Studies at uh, SOAS for inviting us, the studies inviting us to speak about our book. We're very delighted. It's a great pleasure and a great honor. Um, uh, what I will be speaking about is really the genesis of this book, uh, what this book sought to do, and why did we come up with this idea. And basically the aim of this book is to put the Arab and Jewish questions together, questions that often people thought about a lot, but thought of as two separate issues rather interrelated. And we thought that these were actually intimately related questions. And this idea of their intimacy and how their connectedness comes from the fact that emerged from a series of workshops organized by the Kreisky Forum in Vienna uh, as part of a larger project on alternatives to partition in Israel-Palestine. The aim of this workshop where we invited a range of scholars, international scholars uh, in various fields, the aim of this workshop was to bring together and revisit a contemporary Arab engagement with the Jewish question namely how Arab dealt with the question of Jewish political rights under the light of European anti-Semitism and Zionism, as well as explore Jewish engagement with the Arab question, which in itself is about how Zionism and non-Zionist voices, Jewish voices, dealt with Palestinian presence in Palestine with the arrival of Zionism. The aim was to put the two, these two questions, the Arab and Jewish question together because they are intrinsically intertwined and are concerned fundamentally with the issue of citizen rights, the problem of nationalism, and how can we achieve political equality today? So what this book tried to do, thanks to these workshops and then that evolved into papers that we compiled, a total of 11 papers which we compiled in this book. What we tried to show is how to show how the Arab and Jewish question are connected in three important ways. Firstly, they are connected historically. The Arab and Jewish question are connected historically insofar as we try to show, particularly in the first part of the book, how these two questions are tied to Europe, are tied to the history of antisemitism, and specifically to Europe's failure to deal with a non-Christian other and its reliance on colonialism to transport this problem elsewhere, thereby aggravating them. And the first uh, part of the book discusses three different articles that show how Europe the Arab Jewish question is fundamentally a European question. And how this European question of how to deal with the other still continues with us today, in so far as uh, the, the, the other who in the 19th century was the Jew today becomes the Muslim, and in both cases that excluded from an inclusive citizenship. Secondly, the book tries to explore the connection between the Arab and Jewish question politically. In other words, how these two questions are tied with the problem of nationalism and are at the heart concerned with the issue of citizenship and equality and how citizenship and equality can be protected in under what political shape. The aim here, and this is what the second part of the book tries to do, is to highlight the problem of nationalism in aggravating the Arab and Jewish question rather than solving them, since it's tied to in, in exclusion and nationalism, 
that always creates an other, which is to be ostracized and left out, and which ends up uh, limiting one's identity in very segmented ways that deny the diversity of one's identity. And in that respect, we take the figure of the Arab Jew as an example of how binary divisions are central to nationalism and thereby destroy uh, uh, the complexity of uh, identity in the Middle East and elsewhere and foster a hegemonic understanding of political identity that often leads to authoritarian political structures that oppress and negate rather than protect citizens' rights. And thirdly, and this is where the third part of the book focuses on, the Arab and Jewish questions are connected insofar as they allow us to, and they force us, we need to put them together because they allow us to think about an alternative to the present stubborn realities on the ground, the reality of continuing Nakba, the dispossession, and try to think to go beyond partition as a political paradigm to solve the present political impasse. In other words, by putting the Arab and Jewish question together and seeing how they connected historically and politically and are concerned with issues of rights, and who is uh, including the other, it allows us to think, rethink nationalism in more inclusive terms, uh, uh, and which allows us also thereby to talk about different identities in the Middle East, uh, be, be it uh, the Kurdish, the Yazidis, whoever, who are part of the Middle East and need to be included as equals, not as minority in any political configuration. I'll stop at this point and I'll let Bashir take it from there. I just wanted to give you an overview of what the genesis and what a productive conversation allowed us to produce this book. Thank you. Thank you, Laila. Thank you. Bashir, your turn. Thank you, Gilbert and uh, Yair, as well as Dina. And thank you, Laila. And uh, it's a great honor to be here at Southwest Middle East Center. Uh, so my, my contribution is going to be really about trying to put a larger frame to this project the way I understand it, at least. And, and I want to make really some uh, few, um, few comments that really make a made up perspective on this. Uh, first, I want, uh, I want to, to say that this project is uh, one of three pillars that come together from our perspective that make a whole and this whole put together uh, makes sense. Uh, and therefore, this book that uh, the, the, the Arab and the Jewish question is part of the following other two pillars. The first is alternatives to partition. The second is the Holocaust and the Nakba. And the third is obviously this book that we are discussing here, which is the Arab and the Jewish question. The claim is that these put together, these three things put together, actually are informed by two very fundamental observations and, and assumptions. The first is interrogating modernity. That is not to suggest that interrogating modernity is exhausted by only focusing on, three, on these three pillars, but actually to suggest that actually interrogating modernity through these three interesting pillars is paving the way for something that I think would pave the way for some new form of thinking and what I call new moral and political grammar. And let me a little bit elaborate on this. Interrogating modernity here has two dimensions that I think these three pillars put together lead to. One is basically nation state and the national order or basically nationalism. And more specifically, nationalism as the emerging cement and grammar of a global politics after the First World War. And more specifically, nationalism desire for homogeneity, homogeneity, purity, and sameness, which by result actually creates a great deal of, you know, um, if you wish, colonial violence internally and externally. And it is actually in this perspective that we understand the Holocaust and the Nakba, by the way, which, uh, you know, uh, by the way, uh, Gilbert has inspired us in this project and actually in the, in the Holocaust and the Nakba project that, that I speak, spoke about earlier on. So understanding this emerging global national order post the imperial or after the disintegration of the imperial order and specifically its desire for homogeneity is the context within which you understand and interrogate nationalism in a very explicit way and definitely uh, understand some very important events, uh, uh, which is basically the events of other rising, the events of the Holocaust and the Nakba in that spe specific thing. And, and clearly, it is the context within which we understand 
obviously colonial violence and specifically and particularly resettler colonialism, which is, is an extremely fundamental issue when it comes to understanding Zionism in the context of Israel, Palestine and historic Palestine. So this is an extremely important one, you know, one trajectory of understanding these three pillars coming together. The second point that I think is extremely important for understanding these uh, three dimensional project, which this book is one dimension out of these three dimensions, is basically uh, that these kind of understood together in the very specific context of Israel-Palestine, leading to binational ethics and binational interventions of some sort. And that is basically that once these understood mostly through the terrain of alternatives to partition and alternatives to partition is to be understood and contextualized in the larger history of interrogating nationalism and settler colonialism and bringing Europe to the very crux and the center of its imperialist and orientalist kind of enterprise, the way it projected itself in the Balfour Declaration and many other kind of consequences in Palestine, this leads us to suggest how we can engage in a way that we can transcend the existing realities so we can conceptualize a different alternative future for Israel-Palestine. And this is where binationalism comes. And this is why actually in the third part of the book, a huge chunk of the articles there really allude to these types of potential futures. But I, for one, and I think Leila as well, you know, you know, kind of more favor this kind of binational track of interrogation that lead to these types of things. So this is really the meta perspective that we can understand this kind of project. The second point that I want to say that I think is extremely important for understanding the larger context. So if the pillar of alternatives to partition is about thinking about things that go beyond the two-state solution and things that account for the inseparability of the Arab and the Jews, and then the Holocaust and the Nakba are being really inseparable, not in the sense that they, not in the sense that they are equal or similar, but in the sense that they need to be understood in the same context of history and conceptual development of nationalism. And the way the Holocaust, the, the way the Nakba has become inseparable part of the modern history of Jews, and the way the, the Nakba, sorry, the Holocaust has become inseparable part of Palestinian history and present and voluntarily. And the third one is this Arab and Jewish question book, the way Leila had alluded. I think they put together also indicate to a second point that I want to allude to, which is basically, uh, which is basically the claim that this whole enterprise is actually an intervention to rethink the question of Palestine differently. And under no circumstances, I am suggesting that what we are doing here in this enterprise, which was sponsored thankfully by the Bruno Kreisky Forum for International Dialogue in Vienna, is not the only way of rethinking Palestine. And it's not the only way and the only methodology of rethinking Palestinian nationalism. The starting point of our analysis is that Palestinian nationalism is undergoing a very serious rethinking process. And the question of Palestine is going through a serious process of rethinking. Definitely, this is influenced also by a very serious transformation and rethinking in Zionism. And in that way, if I were to sum it up in the second point of macro perspective, this is an attempt to rethink Palestine through a very modest specific contribution of certain methodologies. And under, again, and I repeat this, under no circumstances we are suggesting here that this is the only way or the most exhaustive way of rethinking Palestine. There are contributions that can be doing micro history, cultural history, there can be other ways of political economy to interrogate these types of things and think differently. But I think even these things, the way we look at them, they remain to be very focused on these kind of micro perspective. We are trying here to bring the meta perspective of thinking about these questions in a very specific, larger meta perspective. And the last comment that I want to say here before I conclude is that actually, if I were to sum this book, specific book, which is the Arab and the Jewish question differently, I would identify simply three different registers. The first register, this is a book that seeks to interrogate Europe. This is one. The second thing, this is a book that see, seeks to interrogate Zionism. Okay. And the last one, this is a book that seeks to interrogate Arab nationalism and particularly a very particular variant of Arab nationalism, which is assimilationist form of Arab nationalism. Now, again, and by this I conclude and finish, 
I am not suggesting that this book is doing these three things exhaustively. And I'm not suggesting that this book is doing this unlike any other things, but it is definitely a pioneering book and project that is trying to do this through a very specific and very unique perspective where it brings actually otherwise what has been accustomed to be disconnected, separated questions and actually ties and draws links between otherwise segregated struggles, histories, and conceptual frames. And therefore, the modest aim of this project is really to bring these questions together, to see the intersections, to see the differences, but also to see the productive, instructive way of putting these questions together and to see why Europe is in the Middle East and why the Middle East is in Europe. And going beyond this, this is the way of particularly a decent contribution to how to understand Palestine, Israel differently. Thank you. You are on mute. Uh, many thanks to both of you. Would you like just to describe the book, uh, the number of contributors, how they were selected, uh, you know, and uh, the, the, the a few words on that or, yeah, one of you, Laila or- oh, Okay, yeah. The, the contributors were a diverse group of people who attended these workshops and were willing to submit chapters of what they discussed. So we have people, uh, Ella Shohat, who has some interesting discussion on the Arab Jewish question, on Arab, Arab Jews. We have article by Brian Klug and uh, Gila Anijar on the European question. We have article by um, Masarwe and, and uh, Moshe Bihar on alternative to partition. So we try to include the diversity of Jewish and Palestinian and European voices that deal with, uh, it's a total of 11 chapters uh, plus an introduction. I'm happy to, if you want, I can put the, um, the content of the book, uh, table of content. Thank you very much, Leila, thank you. So, uh, Yair, your turn now, please. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I want to start by thanking uh, Gilbert and Dina for uh, inviting me to give these comments. I want to also thank uh, Leila and Bashir for their comments and for editing this uh, remarkable book. Um, this is a conversation, as we've heard, on Israel-Palestine, on uh, the, the Jewish history and anti-Semitism, on the question of um, uh, the re uh, rights of uh, Palestinians in Palestine, but also on Islamophobia. And all of these uh, put together. But it's also a conversation about about what about that conversation? It's about what conditions are necessary to make that conversation possible, and what directions could this conversation uh, take? Take. Um, and it stands out, and uh, not only because it has uh, many excellent contributions from many colleagues I hold in high esteem and, and it's quite interdisciplinary. So people will find what the kind of directions that interest them more, but it also stands out for me as a kind of a proposition, a kind of project that points or suggests the kind of conversations that we can have, maybe should have. Uh, uh, um, and enabling hopefully uh, a new kinds of engagements, including disagreement. I think that's, that, and that is uh, significant. So I will say something about what makes this book special um, in terms of contributors, um, in terms of the topics, and in terms of the framework and the kind of question that all these pose. Um, so first, I think it should be, it's, it's noteworthy that this uh, book is edited by two Palestinian scholars. I think this is very significant. Um, and this is a book that poses the questions, among other things, of Jewish history and Jewish political rights. And it, it is an unusual uh, development. Now, it rests, uh, to be sure, on a revived engagement with 
the quote unquote Jewish question, the red Jewish history in the Arab world, including, uh, for example, Chick Bear's book, The Arabs and the Holocaust, but a lot of literary and film uh, expression, which I mentioned in the introduction. Um, um, but I think it's one thing to talk about Jewish history in Iraq, uh, in Lebanon, and it's a different thing to talk about it from Palestine. And I think that is an interesting uh, contribution um, uh, that I'd like to hear Nana and Bashir maybe say a bit more about how is what it means to do this from a Palestinian perspective. I think you're not the only one in the sense that there are growing numbers, I think, of Palestinians that are interested in posing these kind of questions. And we have, we hosted a few years ago, uh, the colleague Najat Abdul Haq, who talked about the revived interest in, in, in Jews in the Arab world, and it's on YouTube, uh, yeah, so uh, people can find it. And she's Palestinian, uh, uh, of course. And I think when I look, I mean, clearly you alluded to this, but clearly that interest from a Palestinian perspective seems to, A, in, in, you know, and I think of Leila's work on, on frameworks beyond partition that, that kind, of, kind of lead, if we, you think seriously beyond uh, partition, you need to think about these questions, or, or Bashir's work on the Holocaust and Nakba, but it would be good to hear more from them, the kind of, the, diff, the the different perspectives from, you know, different our perspectives and Palestinians' perspective. Um, the second thing I want to say is the wide spectrum of contributors. In uh, so we have uh, Palestinian editors, as I've said. We have Arab scholars from various backgrounds uh, here. Uh, we have Jewish Israeli scholars and some of them would call themselves Arab as well. Um, and we have diaspora uh, Jewish um, uh, scholars. Uh, so that's quite a, a mixed uh, group. And in political terms, I think when you look at the various positions of scholars, the book spans quite a considerable spectrum. And I think that is, that is unusual. I think we usually get more safer choices in the sense that uh, people are more on this, you know, the, the, the room, the spectrum is, is more limited. Um, and there's a question of how people, you know, when it comes to the Jewish Israeli scholars, how they identify themselves, anti-Zionists, some kind of Zionists and so forth. But there are also real differences beyond the question of mere identification. Um, and, and that kind of poses kind of, interesting questions and maybe the choice of bringing such a varied uh, a group. Um, the third thing I would say is the emphasis on Arab Jews. And I, I, I think we should, you say how unusual it is when we have a volume dedicated to Israel, Palestine, the Jewish question, the Arab question, and half, I think about half of the contributions either engage seriously or center entirely on the question of Arab Jews. Um, and this is really um, unusual. Um, and again, I think this is unusual and it's a welcome development, I think. When you, uh, a lot of times when we tell the story of Israel Palestine, it's about European Jews coming to uh, Palestine establishing Israel. While in fact, uh, you know, something like 50% of Jewish Israeli population has roots in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, so that, you know, however you, what you take on it, this is a significant factor. And I think this volume takes this on board seriously. We also have five uh, Mizrahi contributors. And again, this is unusual when you have uh, Jew, Israeli Jews contrib contributing, this is really unusual. And again, this is a very welcome corrective, I think, to the kind of uh, usual and, uh, story. But, and it's not necessarily, so we have Gil Nijar not writing necessarily about Arab Jews. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't work on the basis of identity politics. It works on the basis of, of a real argument that we see here. 
Uh, and finally, I think there's the framework that, again, as I said, brings together the issue of Israel-Palestine, uh, anti-Semitism, if you want, the kind of the question of, of Jewish history and predicament, and the questions of Islamophobia and Orientalism. And, and this is, that kind of brings in, bringing all these things together, open certain questions. Uh, but let me ask it, uh, this question differently. Why? Why do we have, why don't we have more volumes like this? I think why this is so unusual. And I have, so there's various responses to this. And the first obvious thing is the political difficulties in assembling this kind of volume. So on the one hand, if I talk of Israeli studies or Jewish studies, there are structures of exclusions which exclude uh, Arab and Palestinian scholars uh, to, to be sure. And, but also the other side of the coin is the difficulty and reluctance on op opposition of Arab scholars or scholars in solidarity with Palestine to engage with this kind of uh, uh, um, uh, projects and the questions of boycott and anti-normalizations which are interpreted in different ways, but are, do, are real impediments to this kind of uh, work. But, Okay, these are the more familiar impediments, I would say, but there is another impediment. I think that when we talk about Jewish, Arab, Israeli, Palestinian conversation, it's not clear what the limits of this conversation are. What are we talking actually about? I think this is a really difficult one. And when we think of Israel, um, so there's, there's kind of two parallel conversations, if you wish. One is to think about Israel vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish world. And I think that's, so there is a real dialectics between Zionism and Jew, diaspora Jews, a real dialectic between Israel and Jewish diaspora. And in that story, Palestinians are outsiders. You know, important outsiders maybe, but they are outsiders, okay? And there is a real conversation about place of Palestine in the Arab world. You know, the question of Palestinians in historic Palestine vis-a-vis -vis the refugees outside, the question of Palestinians vis-a-vis -vis the Arab world. And in these conversations, Israelis are outsiders, important outsiders, but nonetheless. So we have a slightly ironic situation where we have a dialectic of domination in Israel Palestine but the conversations, these two conversations push us outside against, you know, we don't, not to discuss it as dialectics, but to discuss it kind of as an external factor. And that is, that is a difficulty. And to, to give an ex example, if we talked about race in the US, we would be in much clearer terms. Of course, there are transnational ramifications of this conversation, but the limits, the geographic, and the social limits are much clearer when we talk about questions like race in the US in terms of who do we talk about? Uh, you know, what is the population? What is the geography? While Israel-Palestine is sprawls over to all directions, in the sense where you can talk about pogroms in Kishinev as part of the Israel-Palestine discussion. You can talk about the Jewish diaspora in the US as part of the uh, Israel-Palestine discussion. You can talk about pan-Arabism as part of the Palestine discussion, of course, on refugees in Lebanon and so forth as part of the Palestine discussion. So it's kind of sprawls of, you know, to, to uh, so many directions that make um, this conversation difficult. Now, there, I think what I see in the book are two directions to deal with this, two approaches. And one is binationalism, which we heard uh, of already. And there are some really interesting, challenging contributions here on binationalism, uh, whether it's by Mara Masawe uh, and uh, Yuval Evry and Hillel Cohen and Derek Pensler um, and, and, and Moshe Behar and all of these they examine binationalism either as a political fact and political possibility or as a methodological fact. So as a methodology of how 
we approach this topic and we approach it through the premise of binationalism to say to focus on these kind of uh, relations between Israelis and Palestinians. But the other direction I see here is not to focus inwards, but to put this within bigger conversations. So put this in the conversation on, on the Arab Spring, on Islamophobia, on anti-Semitism, in a way not, you know, to accept the fact that we cannot delimit neatly Israel-Palestine from these other conversations, and we have to take them uh, uh, on board. And this is the conversation, uh, this is in uh, contributions, for example, by Ella Shohat, by uh, El Rustum, by Brian Klug, and by uh, uh, Gilani Jar, to give some examples here. Um, and yes, and I think that's, that's the two directions and maybe you can, but there is a tension I think between these two directions and maybe uh, you could speak a bit uh, about this. I would say that I think the most, uh, I mean, one of the most interesting, they're all very, very interesting uh, chapters. I think Gilani Jar's chapter is most challenging, I think, philosophically. But I think also what I liked about this that rather than to lament, you know, how we got here, you know, the loss of the place of, of Arab Jews and so forth, he actually opens it as a possibility. He kind of says that there is a kind of fluidity about these identities. The history of identities opens up possibilities of transformation and undetermined nature of these things, which means that there is uh, space uh, for change. And I think in the current uh, a dire situation that we find ourselves, that's, that's, a kind, that's a kind of optimistic way to look at things. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop here and I'll, I'll let Laila and, and, and Bashir respond. Uh, thank you very much, Yair. Um, thank you very much for this beautiful and generous uh, discussion of the book and what we're trying to do and of our ambition. That's definitely, you got, you definitely nailed what we're trying to do. And I will repeat a little bit what Bashir said. The aim of this book, we were fully aware that it is a difficult conversation, but we wanted to start this conversation. And it was a way to start the conversation, as, as you rightly pointed out, it's a difficult conversation to have because of the reason that you mentioned, whether it is people risk of such of exclusion, or that it is because of PDS, or, but both Bashir and I, and those who were participating at the Kraski Forum meeting, it, it was very evident to us that this is a conversation that needs to happen, and needs to happen in an informed way. But the aim from the very beginning, we were very well aware that there are these, as you said, parallel conversations, one about Palestinians' place in the world, and the other one, the relationship between Israel and the diaspora and the dialectic, as you ex explained, of, of Zionism and Jewish diaspora. We did not want to address this. What we wanted to do is say, in the present political impasse, which we see today in Israel and Palestine, and in the present political impasse that the Middle East is and which the Arab uprising revealed very clearly, we see that there is a, a, an undisputable need to re-question nationalism. So that was one of the starting points, if you want, okay? Like if we are now in a 21st century in need of a new political configuration. And this new political confederation in questions nationalism deeply, whether it is Arab nationalism, whether it is Zionism, whether it is European nationalism, okay? So how putting these questions together will allow us to in question the problem of nationalism and more fundamentally, the question of political rights. So what unites Europe, what makes it, as you said, Palestine such a wide spectrum is that we fundamentally talking about what is the meaning of political rights and democracy in the 21st century beyond the framework of hegemonic, limited authoritarian nationalism. This is rejected. The Arab Spring was precisely about that. It's about rejecting a hegemonic understanding of nationalism. It's about calling on the state to protect a citizen. It's, it's, not, it's not about capturing the state, it's about holding the state accountable. So that's one dimension. The other dimension was precisely the reality on the ground in Israel-Palestine. I and mean, we all know we are beyond partition in Israel-Palestine. We have an apartheid reality. You ask, how come I came to this point? I am a political economist. You know, it's my work. I, if you would have asked me 30 years ago, would I have worked on these issues? 
No, but what Allah made me work on these issues precisely when I was doing my field work on Palestinian workers working in Israeli settlements. And I'm discussing with the Israeli settler who tells me, I will never give up my Palestinian worker and never replace him with a foreign worker. And I ask him why, okay? And he says, because we're destined to live together in this land, which reminded me of what Ben, ben Venesti wrote in 1984. We are in a rider, horse rider reality. We, we basically said in 1984, we are in apartheid reality. So the trajectory has been the economic and factual facts on the ground. Realize that we are in apartheid reality, however way you want to call it. An unequal reality, definitely, okay? How do you transcend it? You transcend it by saying, I don't engage, or you transcend by engage on ethical principles as Bashir talked about and as we're all engaging. So what are the ethical principles? And the ethical principle is that we are all equal. That's the fundamental question. That's the question that Europe did not solve till today with the problem of anti-Semitism, with the problem of Islamophobia. How Europe is still struggling with the issue of nationalism in a way that the United States is not, you know, because we don't, we're, not, we're not addressing the issue of race. We're not addressing the issue of colonialism. We're not addressing the legacy of colonialism. So. We, we see again, as Bashir said, that it's a problem of modernity that needs to be decomposed in new language. So what this book allowed us to do, what we try to do is say, where did we start? We started with Europe because Europe, both with the problem of nationalism and the problem of colonialism. Where are we today? And what is the cost of that not dealing with this issue of the, of the right of others? We are in reality that continues to exclude. How can we overcome that exclusion well, we need to be engaged in a conversation based on recognizing the injustice and the inequality and the structural ex ex exclusion in order to start proposing an inclusive political structure. So that's, that's the way I, I, we, we try to, now, as we said, we, this is just the beginning of a conversation. It is not a conclusive conversation. Why it is difficult for Palestinians to, to engage with is because Palestinians are being, you know, Israeli settler colonialism has deepened over the past in the 21st century, did not wane, you know. And many, for many Palestinians, I don't want to even be engaged in this discussion. In other forum which we have, some people, I told them, why do you even engage in this conversation? We have much more things to do than engage with the Jewish question. But those who live on the ground realize that they cannot but engage with this question. The question is how do we engage with this question? And that's what this book tried to show that engaging with the other by recognizing the history and working the, the regional context as well as the international context allows us to come to a new reality, to, to start constructing a new political language. And that was, I think, what we tried to do. But I'll stop at this point and let Bashir continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Leila. Bashir, you want to, to also add a few words? Yes, please. Yeah, if I can do that briefly. Uh... Thank you, Yair. This, this was very, very generous and very comprehensive, and, and you indeed raise several uh, uh, interesting and, uh, and challenging points. But me, let me relate to your first and maybe another, uh, another extra point later on in, in, uh, in my intervention now. Your first point was about why would Palestinian scholars bother with Jewish rights and Jewish modern history and other, all of that. I mean, there are, I mean, there are many different ways how I can address this. And, and you mentioned our earlier work that I did with Amos Goldberg with the Holocaust and the Nakba. Someone would bother also why we do goals that deep into these kind of sensitive explosive materials. But here is very briefly, I'm very happy to elaborate later on, but here is, here is my take on this, the way I understand it. And this is also something that informs this project heavily. Uh, I think Arabs and Jews, in Palestine with all the implications that entails with very transnational kind of connections have become insuperable, okay? This is not only a descriptive account, by the way, this is not a geographical, you know, uh, descriptive account of realities only, but this has very serious implications of how we understand the history of Palestine, which is an intangible relational history that needs to be understood in a context in relation to Europe and in relation to the empires, et cetera, et cetera. And it is precisely in this context that today I believe that there is no moral, consistent, defensible Jewish point of view, if there is anything that is qualified as Jewish point of view, that can be defensible morally without engaging with Palestinian rights and without engaging with the Nakba and the ongoing consequences of the Nakba. So this is one direction of thinking about that. You might come and say, okay, 
fine. So why the Palestinians would bother with the Jewish kind of question? And this is precisely something that, I mean, Leila and I, and many of those who participated in this long project with all the, you know, with, with obviously existing diversities in the views, we are not here representing everyone, you know, this is not a homogeneous view, also informed by a very continuous legacy in the Arab and definitely Palestinian intellectual, mostly literature, as you mentioned, where there is a very clear evidence and not only clear evidence in the terms of, you know, in terms of like empirics, but in terms of why Palestinians ought and need to engage with Jewish history, definitely the way they pay the price as the victims of Zionism and the victims of Europe's antisemitism in Palestine. So in that sense, this inseparability has this historical, and also as I indicated, the conceptual way of this kind of nationalism as a post-imperial kind of order, but it, it but it has manifested itself in the grounds today, that today in the context of the failure of partition, these questions have become much more pressing. These questions have become much more prominent. As you indicated in your, in your work uh, here in the genealogy of partition, I mean, even partition back in the time in 37, 1937 and 1947 was very much of a colonial global intervention that actually intervened in the, in the affair of Palestine in the colonial context of Zionism. But that is still need to be understood in a way where these actually interventions need to be seen in this relational intangible history rather than in these kind of micro perspective. And this is why, for instance, in the work of Ghassan Kanafani, in the work of obviously Lias Khouri, who is very fundamental uh, pillar in this in this project, he did he doesn't have a contribution, but but you know, and obviously in the work of Gilbert, who also uh, is a fundamental figure that inspired also this project. I mean, this is type of engagement that existed there. Now, we try to take this engagement to a different level. We try to push the conversation to different level. This is where literally these things have become inseparable. And the last thing that I want to say in this specific context of partition, you know, partition, uh, you know, had the illusion that the Arabs and the Jews can divorce. That's it. Like, you know, when you are divorced, you externalize the other. That once you externalize the other, you engage with it differently. You know, the Israeli colonial, settler colonial project from day one, but definitely in the past three decades, have, be, have made the Arabs and the Jews inseparable. Their intertwinement is not just a matter of realities on the ground. These are also reflected in a very deep understanding of very powerful forces of nationalism, of very deep forces of colonialism, and very deep forces of, you know, European, European politics and European imperialism. So, and this needs to be understood indeed in these types of context. If I have time, I can relate to a second question very briefly. And that is, you know, what is this whole conversation? Because this whole conversation indeed yeah, yeah, has very serious troubles. I mean, Palestinians rightly so are sick and tired of dialogues. Palestinians don't want to dialogue. Like why would the Palestinians as victims of this whole enterprise with the complicity of Europe inter, you know, come into these conversations of dialogue as if they are equal, as you indicated yourself with the real commissions, you know, as if they are treated, treating the two parties, the victim and the victimizer, the colonized and the colonizer, the oppressed and the oppressor, as if they are equal and are on parity and we are inviting them to come and converse jointly under conditions of parity and equality. This is absolutely nonsensical. And it is precisely this, that when we envisioned this project and we wrote the rationale of this project, we were not inviting people to come and deliberate and converse jointly on the basis of egalitarian politics. But we are clearly were indicating from the very beginning that we are talking about a colonial context through which we are clearly talking about asymmetry of colonial power that needs to be transcended, needs to be digged and interrogated, and needs to be questioned and investigated. And therefore, this is why this conversation, and by the way, one of the most fascinating things about this project, and this is again, we are very grateful to the Bunuk Reiske Forum and Gertrude, who is Borea, who is actually the director of this, because when we engage with this project, we didn't mean to come up with a product actually. And very few institutions would be hosting you continuously, not expecting you to have a product. 
This project was not aiming to produce a product. This project was incremental, transformative, informative, and exchange that was premised clearly on diagnosing the situation from the very beginning as a situation of asymmetry of power, where the need is to engage, to transcend, and go beyond this. And this takes me to the last point of binationalism. And binationalism is definitely the entry here, and I think the only way forward. And for very specific and very, very specific reasons. I mean, post-nationalism, civic expressions of the demands of the Jews and the Palestinians will not go. For the Palestinians, for a very long history of negation of their national identity by Zionism, by European politics, and surely by some Arab regimes. Palestinian identity is an extremely important thing and probably the most important achievement of Palestinian nationalism post Nakba time. If Palestinian nationalism achieved anything in a post Nakba time, it achieved that Palestinians, they are back and big in history as a national group and as a peoplehood. This is the Palestinian we that now is not contested and questioned, but what is contested and questioned is its leadership and the functional of its national institutions. Not the very fact of existence of Palestinian nationalism, which until 30, 40 years ago, our fathers and grandfathers were contested questions and actually interrogated about their national identity. For the Israeli Jewish side of the story, it's a very different history and I'm not equating and it's a different genealogy and a genealogy of settler colonialism that created a national group that is a fact of the ground of six millions, more than six million Israeli Jews that have robust, vivid, developing kind of culture, again, within the wrap of a settler colonial roots and settler colonial, not only roots, but existing things that is actually pushing very clearly to dominate, eliminate the Palestinians, et cetera, et cetera. But it is in this precise context that the egalitarian binationalism that Leila and I speak and some other contributors here is actually conditional on a very serious process of historical reconciliation and decolonization under which there is no, under no circumstances, it will be accepted any form of Jewish exceptionalism, Jewish privileges or Jewish particularism. And in that sense, it is this egalitarian binationalism that I think to be understood in the context of also looking today how Palestinian advocacy for these types of rights is immediately translated and cashed out into anti-Semitism. And you know this better than I do in Britain and other places where the IRA definition is being instrumentalized, deployed and put forward to criminalize Palestinian struggle. And what is the Palestinians guilty of? The Palestinians are guilty of, and those who are supporting the Palestinians in their advocacy and in solidarity with them, they are criminalized for advocating what the ultimate crime that is equality. So it is in this context why we think binationalism in its egalitarian version has a very powerful, you know, decolonizing power and decolonizing enterprise. So seeing these things all put together, obviously, uh, you know, it clarify you know, again, the potentiality and the, 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 the opportunity of this project, but also sees why at the end of the day, and this is not a romantic statement. This is a very bold, I have no sense of apology about this. The only way forward for the future of Israel-Palestine is Arab-Jewish partnership. Our Jewish partnership that is premised on parity, equality, mutual legitimacy, under context of very clear decolonization under which there will be very fundamental dismantling of any Jewish colonial privileges of any sort where it is based on reparative historical justice that will bring the question of refugees into centrality and rethink Palestine not to be reduced only as to the borders of 1967 and reducing the question of Palestine to be about independence and statehood. The Palestinian question is not about statehood. The Palestinian question is about very fundamental basic rights collectively and individually. The minute the frame and the solution addresses these questions, we can move forward. Leila and I in this decent project, without now speaking on behalf of every contributor in this, seek to pave the way for trying to address these questions modestly through paving the way to identify potential instructive and productive conversation on how we can move forward to that direction of decolonization and historical reconciliation. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much to, to all. I, I mean, I, I let you uh, speak because the, it seems that the audience is uh, happy listening to you, uh, to discussing. Uh, very, actually, I, I've seen only, only uh, one kind of question, which is more a, a comment than a question, but uh, I'll get back to that. Uh, I think the, the discussion showed how, how much uh, uh, this, this book is, uh, I mean, provides a food for thought. I mean, well, one can see all, all this discussion and the year confirmed that there's a lot of food for thought in this book. It's an extremely stimulating book. And, uh, uh, and it, it, I mean, there are so many issues that are also uh, uh, tackled. Uh, within the book that it opens uh, a lot of, of, of doors to, to, to uh, really on, on many, on many uh, discussions. Um, uh, the, I, mean, the, uh, I would probably, as long as we don't have any kind of uh, list of questions yet, and I would encourage people who have questions listening to us to, to use the Q&A uh, a device and uh, type their, their question. But uh, uh, maybe we can continue for, for a while, a little while at least, the, the, this dialogue. And uh, Yair, how would you react to uh, uh, Bashir's definition of, uh, of the solution and binationalism and how he sees the, the future? Um, uh, and of course, I, I want to emphasize what uh, both Leila and, and Bashir said, that this is not uh, a kind of uh, party line in the book. It's not a monolithic or homogeneous or whatever book. It's a book with multiple authors. They have different views on, on many issues. They are certainly not all on, on any kind of, uh, of single perspective. Although I would say, in order to be able to do such books, you need people with, with at least the possibility of dialogue and possibility of thinking in common. Uh, uh, and and that, that's why you can have this kind of thing, which is, of course, not, uh, uh, you, you can't achieve by taking people at random among uh, communities of the communities that are involved. So that, that, uh, that here requires some kind of, uh, of possibility of dialogue. And, and that's also what the, 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 the two editors share with, uh, with Yair. Uh, uh, this possibility of discussing these these issues, and uh, so yeah, you you want to to react to that, the uh, the last uh, bit of uh, of uh, of Bashir's uh, 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 intervention. So I think okay. So in in terms of binationalism, uh, first of all, it's 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 uh, as you know, it's not an obvious uh, choice. I mean, the the very and the very recognition of, uh, I think the one question here is, I mean, the recognition of Palestinian national rights, but it, which is, you know, it's a much more dire requirement. And here you have a history of denial of these rights, which is a century old. Um, and that is the more pressing question in a way uh, but there is the question of Jewish or Israeli political rights, I think, within the, uh, within any future scenario, which the book puts on the table, I think, which I think is not an obvious thing for, for um, uh, many Palestinians or many people who support Palestinians. I think, the, you know, it's, and Israel seems so strong, so why do you need to, why do you need to care about this? But in a way, I mean, you have to, because if you don't, if you don't say what exactly is to happen with the Jewish Israelis, then A, you're not going to bring them on board anytime, not now, but not also in a hundred years. You need to spell out what, uh, uh, and, and second, you open yourself to various uh, criticism that, you know, it may, you know, including that you want to push them into the sea and so forth. So that is, I think, I, I think this is uh, crucial. In terms of binationalism as a framework, first of all, it has to be part of the, so even if we were talking about two-state solution and so forth, and Israel in the 67 borders, there is a Palestinian minority of 20%, you cannot think of a minority with 20% that does not have natural rights. It's, that doesn't, it's, it's not a democracy. 
as long as that might, you know, uh, and of course we are beyond that stage, I think. I mean, it's very unlikely that we'll see partition. So if that's not going to happen, then we are clearly in the territory of binationalism. But it's it's not it's not an obvious it's not an easy uh, path in any way um, for many many reasons. Uh, but uh, one is that I think for binationalism to work, it would require uh, a meta identity that would somehow bind this group together. I don't think you can just have, I think that's, that's one of the difficulties that I think, uh, and also it opens a lot of questions that I think needs to be, uh, need to be uh, uh, discussed in a way that, um, uh, in a way that um, in many places where we have binationalism or multinationalism, say the UK, we have a British identity, which kind of overarching and, and people can choose if they feel very English or very British. If you don't have that and you have only Jews versus Palestinians, that creates a more antagonistic potentially situation. Um, and the question is how does, how does it relate to the Jewish diaspora I think is important. And also the Palestinians as well. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. On your last question on how it relates to the uh, Jewish diaspora, this is a question that I am personally not interested in, and I don't think it's our job. It's 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 a this conversation that used to happen between Israelis and Jews, and, and you know diaspora Jews, and I think has has continued ever since Israel's creation. You know very well this relationship with the diaspora is complex, is diverse. Uh, uh, the aim, our, our aim was not to get engaged into that. It's more, to, I, I want to focus on the issue of binationalism. I think we can shoot ourselves in the foot if we get fixated on what is the format of the state. What this, what this project, uh, what we try to do with this project and what we're trying to show is that we need to rethink the state. You know, practically, if you, if you talk practically, people tell you, oh, maybe we can have a confederation, maybe it can be, you know, a, a, another federation. Like, we, you know, everybody is supportive of the two-state solution, nothing can happen. So there are two dimensions that our book does not address the geopolitics. We did not address the geopolitics. Uh, and we did not address also the political economy. I mean, if you look in the short term, yeah, nothing's going to happen. Israel is very powerful, nothing changes. Uh, Israel doesn't need to engage in this question. And Palestinians don't need to engage in this question. But this is not our aims. Our aim is that given now something finished, we tried a two-state solution and we know it did not work. And Israel will realize, and as Rabin already said it, this was the biggest success to have a two-state solution and Zionism could not accept it. As Yes Huri once said, Zionists cannot even accept Palestinian defeat. So it's even when you cannot, when Zionism cannot exist without Palestinian, even with Palestinian defeat. And we see more crudely its colonial and identity, however much it's also a national identity. The question becomes very important for Israelis, how do they deal with their colonial essence? This is a question Israel today doesn't need to address because it's very powerful, but sooner or later it will catch up with it, just as South Africa was caught up with it, just as the United States was caught up with it. We are in a different historical juncture. We are at the 21st century, and in this 21st century, the old answers of nationalism of the 20th century do not work, okay? And we need to rethink the state, and we don't know exactly how to do it. So I think if we start thinking like that, if, if the starting point becomes how do we ensure in the 21st century equality for all in a political configuration where we believe in the equality of all, rather than superiority of one national group of another, then we can open a conversation. This doesn't mean that we have a solution, but it does allow us to pose questions that, that the partition paradigm did not allow us because the partition paradigm said we don't need to deal with Israelis. Okay, fine, they won, they have, we are being so generous at Palestinian, we gave them 78, they have 78% of historic Palestine. Okay, they live there, we live here. But given that partition did not work because Israel did not make it work, because Israel proved that it cannot but be colonial, then sooner or later you have to face this reality. How do we decolonize in the 21st century? That's what's being posed. And this is an answer which I don't think can be answered without addressing what's happening in the Arab world. 
without seeing the connection between authoritarian regimes and colonial regimes, without seeing that it's now we're going to talk much more about the Jewish question in the Arab world because Saudi Arabia, because the Emirates and Israel signed a peace in, in a way to trivialize the question. OK, so it is a question that is posing us to re, re examine power structures and how do you empower liberatory politics in the 21st century? If we look at it this way, we can see some venues. Doesn't mean that we have a solution, but we start walking in the right direction. That's what I think we're trying to do. Thank you. Thank Where you. Can uh, I relate to this? Uh, yes, you, you, you can, Bashir, but uh, just let me slip into that uh, a question that is related to the, the issue. There's someone please, raising yeah, yeah. the issue. Yeah, I, I saw the question. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, there is someone raising the issue of the refugees and their place, the Palestinian refugees, of course, and, and their place in, in all that. So if you could address this also, please. And then I will have uh, Dina asking a question, and there is a question from the audience. Sure. So, so very briefly, in, in relation to two points before I address the, the question of the refugees, and I will tie these two comments to the, to the question of refugees. Yair rightly so said, you know, Israel is powerful. Why Israel would bother, you know, with, with get, getting into this kind of enterprise of binationalism, which, which gives Palestinians way much power than they can afford at the moment, or they have anyway. And, and there is a very interesting question here, and I briefly relate to this in the following way. I mean, despite the success, the success of Zionism and this, the, the way where the state of Israel exists today, you know, uh, you, you know the state, as the says of the, the Israeli identity and Jewish nationalism, the way Zionism has manifested itself with it, continues until today to suffer from two serious problems. That problem in the eyes of Palestinians, at least, or in the eyes of its victims, that is the issue of legitimacy and the issue of normalization. In any interaction between a Palestinian and an Israeli Jew, and let alone a Jew in general sometimes, but with Palestinians and an and, and Israeli Jew, there is this very disruptive affair in which actually the Israeli Jew often put in a very state of discomfort despite the mighty, despite the success, despite the powerful. And that discomfort stems from the fact that in the eyes of the Palestinians, as far as the politics in this land is orchestrated against, like, along the lines of Jewish supremacy, Jewish privilege, Jewish, and I mean Jewish Israeli, Jewish Israeli privileges and Jewish Israeli supremacy of some sort, and oppression of the Palestinians. There is no legitimacy that is granted to this enterprise and to this existence and surely the rights in the eyes of the Palestinians. And this is precisely the issue of normalization as well. And I'm not talking about normalization the way Israel is normalization, normalizing with the Emirates or with Sudan. I'm talking about normalization in the very profound sense of the word of how we can turn a colonial, settler colonial state into one in which actually the victim or the native can accept the settler under certain circumstances of decolonization and dismantling of privileges of different sort and, and colonial power. So this is an extremely important and powerful thing, you know, and I, to demonstrate this point, you know, Israel, after so many years of negotiating with the Palestinians and more than 70 years of existence, goes back to ask the Palestinian to to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. This means that the Palestinians still hold so much power and more than anyone can imagine. Now this power is not cashed out and translated into serious power simply because of dysfunctional, corrupt, and, and you know, Palestinian political system of some sort that has its own problems. I agree with you, I agree with you that the Palestinian has here very powerful, you know, cost to pay. And why the Palestinians go and recognize some form of Jewish Israeli nationalism of some sort, even if it is decolonized? And this is a very open question. And I think, you know, I have my own particular view on this, and I have this in my writings, and others have contributed to this as well. And this is exactly the debate, shall we go to individual or collective rights? What is much more relevant in this context? And you are right. Uh, and by this, I finish in this kind of binationalism. You know, your questions about this overarching we or our overarching identity that needs to be, this is not a prerequisite. This is a prerequisite if we were to conceptualize politics as to be institutionally as one homogeneous state or one even binational the way one can imagine. The binational enterprise can be institutionally and constitutionally 
cashed out in multiple forms and modalities. What we are talking about by nationalism here is as an ethical principle, uh, which actually give rise to multiple forms of solutions. That is, if the entry is by national ethics, and if the entry is by nationalism that is premised on parity and Jewish Arab partnership, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Palestinians, for that matter, can live with multiple solutions. Palestinians can live with confederation, with federation. And that is an invitation for Israeli Jews to live with these types of things without compromising their right to national determination under these conditions. So this is why binationalism, from my point of view, might appeal to Israeli Jews way much more than the liberal discourse of you know, rights of individuals. And what might bind us together is a historical process that might be capitalizing on Mizrahi, capitalizing on, you know, constitutional commitment to certain patriotic rights of, you know, commitment to rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you are right. There is a very serious challenge whether this identity exists, whether this, but, but what is existing there, what is existing there, the overarching frame that brings us and the land and the history and this intertwinement that are in the making as we speak, that actually lend some serious support to law along the line of binationalism without binationalism, meaning that you will have to create a hybrid Jewish Israeli identity through intermarriages or something. It might be the case in the future, but this does not really produce what it needs. As for refugees in this ethical frame, it's clear that the Palestinian right of return is at the core of what Palestinian identity is. This is why we are insisting, Leila and I, and many others, obviously, that the Palestinian struggle is about rights. One of the most fundamental rights of what defines the modern experience of Palestinian nationalism post nakba time is the right of return, is the right of return in the very profound, you know, in the very profound understanding of it. How to realize that right in practicality is a different question than the principle engagement of the ethical foundations of the right of return as a very serious ethical intervention to interrogate the racism and the super colonial enterprise of the state of Israel and how it paves the way for restorative historical reconciliation through which you achieve this kind of joint living of some sort in different institutional modalities that we can cash out whether that federation confederation or even two state solutions, by the way, but not the two state solution that Israel speaks. And not the two state solution that Leila is right. Not the two state solution that represents this Westphalian robust understanding of sovereignty to be Jewish exclusive sovereignty. There is no Jewish exclusive sovereignty under the rubric and the ethics of binationalism the way we speak about it. There is no vulgar ethno-nationalism in the form of a status Jewish state under the rubric of binationalism that we speak of it. And this has direct implications on how Palestinian identity manifests itself and how Palestinian rights are realized that they don't actually lead to any form of vulgar ethno-nationalism that is Palestinian as well. I mean, that danger is less of a, of a concern for me because of my understanding of Palestinian nationalism, but it is definitely a very worry, some concern in the case of Zionism, having to understand that Zionism is largely by mainstream of its stand, vulgar ethno-national form of enterprise that inform most of these strands of Zionism. Okay, thank you very much. Now we, we, now we have a, a number of questions and uh, little remaining time. So we need, we need to, to address them. Uh, uh, Dina was uh, asked for the floor first. So Dina, can you uh, uh, formulate your, your question, uh, please, or your intervention, your comment? Yeah. Um, and uh, maybe then I will also read the, 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 what we have and then give the floor back to, to our speakers to, so that they address the different questions that we have for now. Dina, please. Thank you very much. It's a good question about why nationalism. It glosses over a lot of other issues, including religion and including ethnicity. So how do you deal with that? Um, uh, so I think, you know, sort of we need to understand how it glosses, you know, and particularly in relation to the idea of religion being a significant uh, kind of uh, characteristic or component of how Israel sees itself. So, so that needs that needs to be, uh, you know, I just would like an answer to that if it's possible. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dina. And let me just uh, check the question. We have a question about uh, um, uh, is Jewish Arab partnership that doesn't reproduce the two distinctive categories of Arab and Jew uh, uh, possible? Um, I mean, our participants can, can read the question. I'm not going to, to read the whole question. Um, there is one about uh, uh, demographics uh, with uh, regard to, 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 to everything we were discussing, of course. Um, we have a question uh, about uh, uh, the uh, ongoing influence and intervention of the United States and Europe in the occupation and uh, how to uh, propose accountability to the states. Um, uh, a question about uh, the, uh, the concept of uh, settler colonialism. Uh, and at what point do settler colonialists cease to be settler colonialists? Uh, probably at what point they cease to be colonialists because otherwise if, it, if they cease to be settlers, that would uh, uh, change the problem. Um, how do you distinguish binationalism from the, what is now today called consociationalism or whatever, that is a sectarian uh, uh, political system, Lebanese style? Um, and uh, yes, and uh, that's, uh, these are the, the, the questions that, uh, that uh, we, we have for now. Please, who wants uh, to, to, to speak first? Leila, please. Uh, I'll go first and I'll, I'll try to be brief because I, I realize we only have 10 minutes. So uh, I, will, I will address maybe the easiest question and the more hard, when do the, the settler colonial stop being colonial? Is when they are stripped of their power. <laughs> That's as simple as that, is, you know, I don't know. It's not a simple answer, but I think fundamentally the issue is it's not expelling the people, is is expelling or ending any privileges to one group at the expense of other. And this can happen only through power. Now, what power do the Palestinians have? Well, the Palestinians have the power, the only power of their, of their presence on the land, and that they are part of a larger Arab world, which is today re questioning itself and wants a new political configuration. Again, I cannot help bring it back to the Arab uprising because the Arab uprising, which we now celebrate, is, it, it commemorate its 10th anniversary. Although it failed, it, it did pose the, a clear message to everybody that the Arab world has changed and is changing and it's not sustainable. And the fundamental question is how do we, are we gonna reestablish a political order in the Middle East that guarantees equality and development? And right now we don't have any answer, but the answer is being posed in very serious matters. And I think these are interconnected. As to the issue that raised by, by um, about the Jewishness of the state, the Jewishness of the state of the point of Dina, this is part of Zionism definition of its nationality, okay? I don't think the problem is nationalism, even if it is posed as nationalism, the problem is the religious nationalist discourse, okay? But we also are seeing the limit of a religious nationalist discourse. Even the Islamists, even the right-wing Israelis, the fact that they can afford to have an, an, a religious nationalist discourse is because they're powerful. But when we saw the nationalist Islamist discourse, it did not succeed because it doesn't have any different solution to the issue of political participation and development happening in the Middle East. So I think the question will be, how we can, we're going to find the means to decolonize Israel and democratize the Middle East. Both are interrelated. Uh, now, what is the role of Europe and the US? A lot and nothing. Uh, I think one of the reasons why we feel very much in an impasse is because our situation on the ground as Arab and as Palestinian is pretty bad. The only thing going for us is our perseverance, but this in itself is not enough. How are we going to get out of the impasse is still to be seen, but I think there are lots of initiative of various levels, both economically, socially, grassrootly, and literary, political happening. They have not yet coalesced into a clear political message, but I think it's clear as, as um, Gilbert's book, uh, you know, Morbid Symptoms revealed, you know, that the old is dead and the new is not yet born. And we are a little bit in that phase. And, and in that phase, we, Bashir and I, what we try to do with this book is raise the important questions to, to be addressed. 
ethically, again, binationalism not as a political formula, but as a way of rethinking rights and status in the 21st century. Thank you, Leila. Bashir, you want, yes? Yeah, but very briefly about the, you know, whether binationalism really reproduces, uh, you know, the distinct categories of Arab and, and Jews. It definitely, it has this risk, uh, you know, but again, I mean, the way we are speaking about it definitely in my earlier work individually and my work with Amos Goldberg in the Holocaust and the Nakba, we address these questions precisely about the robustness of this identity. And we say, you know, the solution is not to ask the Jews to strip themselves from their national identities, definitely not to strip the Palestinians from their national identity under conditions of negation and denial over centuries, uh, over a decade, sorry. But it's actually to say that actually the mere fact of moving to this spy national ethics itself ethically, not descriptively. Descriptively, we are talking about a very serious, complicated, oppressive, asymmetrical arrangement. The minute we move into the egalitarian binationalism, this is the this is this is the key word, egalitarian binationalism, not actually colonial binationalism, but egalitarian binationalism. We are suggesting here that there is and ought to be either whether institutionally or socially some relaxation of this robust communitarian identifications of things. And this takes me to the, to the question of Dina. And I think the question of Dina conceals a very serious, profound, also questioning of Palestinian nationalism. Leila's, Leila's intervention was in relation to Zionism. It's also in relation to Palestinian identity. One of the most alarming things about the development of uh, Palestinian Isla Islamism, uh, like political Islam with Hamas and the Jihad, also needs to be understood in the you know, in the genealogy and the development of Palestinian nationalism, which is part of the crisis of Palestinian nationalism. Because one of the most interesting thing with partition is that Palestinian nationalism moved to this kind of partition together with ethno-nationalism as well. And that is the, that the Palestinian got redefined in that way. And that redefinition moved from ban arab visits, which was kind of to, ter you know, territorial and sometimes even civic articulation of that into something that is much more ethnicized. It is precisely at this point of view where the Jews have become internal rather than external, thanks to their settler colonial greed and to their settler colonial expansionist, that the Palestinians are at a point where they are asking themselves, who is the Palestinian? Who is the Palestinian not politically? Who is the Palestinian in terms of rights? And if the Palestinian is all the Palestinians, then what is there as a political as a political values, political values that inform their national identification under conditions of intertwinement with the Jews. And it is precisely at this point where Palestinian, I, I don't like this word, but Palestinian political Islam, I, I mean, you know, the, the Palestinian Islamist kind of movements run into very serious challenge, but it's also, it's a way of looking at the diversity of Palestinian nationalism. And that is not only that you cannot reduce Palestinian nationalism to Islam, and you cannot reduce Palestinian nationalism to Palestinian Islamists. And this is exactly where, you know, when you speak by nationalism, it is precisely the more successful entry because Palestinians, Palestinians have a very robust Palestinian national movement. Now, the institutional dysfunctionality of Palestinian nationalism does not mean that Palestinian nationalism and identity is not robust. The other way around, Palestinian national identity is much more stronger than any time before if we take the, the link history of negation and denial. Now, what is the diversity within Palestinian nationalism? This is precisely the type of question that the Palestinian need to openly question and interrogate Hamas and the Jihad and Hizb al-Tahrir and many others, and also revive their own internal ideological things about their left and about their right and about Fatah and different things, about what is today to be a Palestinian governed by which types of principles and values. And I think it is also a point of view today that when I think about, when I argue about, not alone, but when, when we argue about this rethinking and redefining Palestinian nationalism, part of what is entitled, in, by, entitled sorry, what, part of what is required in this process of, or what is happening, not only required, it's not like a wishful thinking. These types of conversations are taking place maybe in pockets, in margins, but these are significant, important pockets and margins where they are becoming louder about which type of Palestine they wish to think. 
And Palestine, again, not institutionally, not only as a state, but also as a form of values. And I think there is a great deal. Now, in the Israeli side, the story is even more complicated. But obviously, we cannot deny that despite all of these internal Jewish Zionist diversity, there is a very robust Jewish-Israeli national movement that it has obviously colonially, very bold colonial sets of colonial dimensions to it. So again, binationalism here does not imply necessarily uh, something that actually has this identitarian thing, but is actually could manifest itself in an ethical principle of equality. Now, what is exactly the identity that might develop? This is not to be subjected to lab conditions of engineering that will be presupposing any you know, factual things on the ground, how things will develop in reality, because otherwise we will engage in some very problematic engineering that I don't think is very constructive here. The last thing, if I can say, which is we will conclude with this, is basically the question about sectarianism and binationalism and concessionalism. Concessionalism is not binationalism, okay? Concessionalism, as you, very, you know very well, uh, Gilbert and those who are in there, you know, it's, a, it's about power sharing arrangements between enclaves and different sectarians. Binationalism is speaking about two national groups, okay? Two national groups that are entitled to national self-determination. When we speak about concessionism, we are not talking about self-determination to group. We are assuming a we, as Yair indicated earlier. We are assuming that there is a national identity and there is self-determination to every one that is called the group. In, in binationalism, concessionism, now, Binationalism might entail concessional arrangement, okay? But binationalism presupposes and assumes that we are talking about two national groups that are entitled to collective national rights. Chiefly among them is the right to national determination. How they cash out that, either in federation or confederation, if you are closer to the federation business, you are in concessional arrangements. If you go to the confederational business, you are in a much more complicated, also concessional, but much more complicated one that is premised on national interests rather than assuming and presupposing a collective political community that is homogeneous or attached to a center that brings together to a link cementing and gluing principles or uh, an identity that might call a we of some sort. Okay, thank you, thank you, Bashir. Thank you very, very much for our three panelists, for to Leila, to, 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 to Bashir, and to Yair, for this uh, very stimulating discussion, this very stimulating session about a very, very stimulating book, which I encourage our audience to, 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 to read, to, to borrow, to read, to acquire, uh, but to read. That's the, the key point. Thank you very much. Thank you. For, Thank you uh, very much. The, Thank you for you. The Center for, for Palestine Studies, uh, chaired by, by Dina here. Th many thanks to Thank Aki, you. who organized technically uh, uh, the, this event. And uh, well, all the best to, 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 to all the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.